Welcome back to the Manly Saints Project. By me, Hugh Hunter. We live in a world that struggles to understand the virtues of manliness. Our culture doesn't provide young men, or any men for that matter, with a lot of positive male role models. When I became a Catholic, I wanted to show how the saints could be manly role models for us. My weekly exploration of manly saints became the Manly Saints Project. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the links in the show notes to buy me a beer. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today to meet the saint who wielded two swords. Name, Mercurius. Life, died around 290 AD. Status, Saint. Feast, November 25th. In the year 361 AD, the Christians of the Roman Empire got a terrible surprise. The persecution of Christians had ended about 50 years earlier. Constantine the Great had made Christianity legal and had become a Christian himself. Since then, the emperors had all been Christians. But Flavius Claudius Julianus, the new emperor Julian, had just told the empire that he had been a secret pagan for a decade, and now that he had come to power, he intended to make Rome pagan again. The man that history remembers as Julian the Apostate was well equipped to strike a blow against the church. Julian was handsome, with the strong body of a sprinter. He was an accomplished general. He was also a reader, a lover of the old pagan classics, and a student of philosophy. Some emperors were brutes who responded to criticism with military force. Julian was just as likely to respond by writing a witty satire, one that poked fun at everyone, himself included, suggesting that maybe people just didn't like his beard. Even as Julian reminded his readers of the economic and military protection that was his to give or to withhold. And Julian's interests in philosophy led down some dark paths. Julian's teacher and friend, the Neoplatonist philosopher Maximus, was famous for his learning. But Maximus's studies had also led him to magic. He was known for a ritual by which he had made the idol of the witch goddess Hecate come to life, with the torch in her hand bursting into flame and her laughter rolling through her temple. Scholar, athlete, General, pagan, magician. This was the new emperor. The great project of Julian's life would be the restoration of paganism and the destruction of the church. Now, the traditional way for an emperor to attack the church was to force Christians to sacrifice to the gods and then torture and kill them if they refused to comply. Julian knew that this approach would drive the church underground, and he didn't want that. Yet. Instead, he defunded churches and refunded pagan temples. Then he began, as we might say, cancelling Christians. Being a Christian made you ineligible to work for government. And it also made you unqualified to be a teacher, since only pagans were allowed to teach pagan materials which put most of history and literature off-limits for Christians. Julian's men found all the teachers of heresy who had been banished to small remote places, and brought them back to keep Christians busy arguing among themselves. Before the crucifixion, Jesus had prophesied that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. The destruction, Christians said, marked the transition from the Old Covenant to the New One, God's presence in the temple, to God's presence as the word made flesh. To further destabilize the church, Julian decided to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, though his efforts were prevented by fires and an earthquake. Soon into the reign of Julian, his policies were having effects. 
they were damaging the church. For Christians, this was a nightmare. They had been so careful about coming out of hiding, and now that they had, everything was going to be lost. There was little they could do but turn to God and the saints. And then Julian hit upon another plan so ambitious that it made the Christians' blood run cold. It was a gamble, but if he won, Julian would have the political capital to turn Rome back to paganism. Julian was going to conquer Persia. Now, Alexander the Great had conquered Persia. But since then, Persia had risen again, embracing the military tactics of the East, using fast-moving cavalry archers. It was a tactic that the Roman legions had always struggled to overcome. Persia had become the prize that the Romans could never quite grasp. The plutocrat, Crassus, had been the first to try, and the Persian king had captured him and poured molten gold into his mouth to show Crassus what the Persians thought of wealthy men playing general. Since then, the list of people who had tried and failed to conquer Persia included Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and even Constantine the Great. The Persians had captured one emperor alive and used him as a human footstool. If Julian could pull it off, he would be viewed as a second Alexander the Great, and a man of such stature could surely mold the empire and lead it back to the old ways. As Julian led his army to Persia, so the story goes, St. Basil the Great was in prayer in front of an icon showing Our Lady and a military saint, Mercurius, depicted holding a spear. Basil poured out his fears for the church and asked for the intercession of the saints. But when he looked up at the icon, he got a shock. St. Mercurius was no longer there, as if he had been painted out of the picture. St. Mercurius had died a little over a century before, in the persecutions of another emperor, Decius. Decius hated Christians, but he wasn't subtle about it, like the emperor Julian. Decius simply forced everyone to sacrifice to the gods, and when Christians refused, he had them tortured, and if they still refused, he had them executed. It was also in Decius's time that Romans began to encounter the Goths, a barbarian people who were moving south and west into the empire. Decius had come to power through his military victories over the Goths, but he was still fighting them by the time he became emperor. Now, in one of Decius's legions, there was a young man named Mercurius. Mercurius was a lapsed Christian. Or to be more precise, Mercurius's father had been a Christian but Mercurius had never given the question of religion much thought. On one occasion, the armies of Decius were struggling with a Gothic warband. After a day of hard fighting, Mercurius slept, and in his dream, he had an encounter that would change his life. He dreamt that he saw a huge and powerful man. The man's body radiated light, and Mercurius realized that this must be an angel. The angel was dressed for war. And when he saw Mercurius, the angel gave Mercurius a sword and told the young soldier not to forget his god. It was a rather strange thing to say to a lapsed Christian. In the morning, Mercurius woke up, and something filled him with a battle fury the like of which he had never experienced. He hacked his way through the enemy to where the enemy commander was, and met the man in single combat, killing him there. Now, in the old Roman Republic, a man who killed an enemy commander on the field of battle was honored with the gift of a golden wreath, or crown. The emperors, though, preferred to be the only ones wearing crowns. They knew how easily a decorated soldier could become a hero, and then a rival so they handled rewards themselves. To reward Mercurius for what he had done, Decius made him an officer. So now Mercurius was an imperial officer. But he kept thinking about the sword in the dream, 
and the words of the angel. And as he did, he began to realize that he had not forgotten his father's Christian faith. Now that he was a famous man, noticed by the emperor, Mercurius knew that at some point soon he would have to make a decision about whether he was going to pursue his military career or be a Christian. It was only a matter of time before he was called to make a sacrifice at Decius's side. When the moment came, Mercurius refused to make the sacrifice. Decius was shocked. Mercurius stood in front of him and tossed the cloak and standard-issue belt that were the symbols of a soldier at the emperor's feet. An Egyptian tradition has him telling Decius, Take back thine honor, for when I came forth from my mother's womb I was naked, and I will depart from hence naked. And he cried out, saying, I am a Christian. Hear, O all ye people, I am a Christian. In the story, both Decius and Mercurius see the situation through the lens of honor. Mercurius has worked his whole life to achieve honor as a soldier. Decius asks him if he now wants to live in disgrace. Mercurius says, I have received a mark of honor which is indestructible. It's not that Mercurius has come to hate his previous life as a soldier. It's rather that Mercurius feels he has been drafted into another, more important conflict by the angel who gave him the sword. We call Mercurius the saint with two swords. For a time, he had used them both, but the emperor was forcing Mercurius to choose between them. And so Mercurius tells him, Inasmuch as I have come to this place, I shall conquer thee and thy father, Satan, through whom all evil existeth. And when I shall have conquered, a crown will be set upon my head by the true master of the contest, my Lord Jesus the Christ. Therefore, whatsoever thou wishest to do unto me, that do quickly, and make no long tarrying. For I have upon me the whole armor of God and the breastplate of faith. The Emperor Decius sends Mercurius to be tortured. But through the tortures, Mercurius does not recant. And in the evenings, when Mercurius is thrown into a dungeon, the angel who had given him the sword comes to him again to heal him and prepare him for whatever the Emperor has in mind for the next day. If you are trying to understand what is going on in the story of St. Mercurius, this is an important clue. When Decius sees that the tortures will not work, he sends Mercurius away to be executed. And on the way, Mercurius has one final vision. But this time it's not the angel, it's Christ himself. And in this vision, the themes of honor, of the martyr as athlete, of the martyr as battlefield hero, are all wrapped up in a few words from Jesus. Mercurius, come thou and rest with me, for thou hast finished thy course. Thou hast kept the faith. Receive thou the warrior's crown. There's one more thing that we need to make sense of this story, which is what happened to the antagonist, to Decius. Did he go on to honor and victory? No. Soon afterward, the reign of Decius came to an end in an encounter with another Gothic warband. Decius' army was outmatched in a swamp where Decius watched his son and heir fall before he himself was killed. Now, it is clear that St. Mercurius was venerated in the early church. But the story I have just told dates from much later. And many people will tell you that because of this, it is unreliable. Which, if you ask me, completely misses the point, because the story I have just told is the story of every Christian who was raised in the faith, returns to it, and comes to understand it in a deeper way. When we first meet Mercurius, he has thrown himself into a career. And that is quite appropriate, 
Christians are called to work hard and be good at things. The angel reminds him of what he already knows, really, that there is a greater conflict, a spiritual one, and gradually, Mercurius realizes that he must choose which conflict will take priority in his life. Which of his two swords will he wield? Career or faith? From our vantage point, we can see that one of these things leads to an ignominious death in a swamp, and the other leads to a martyr's crown. But that's always easier to notice in other people's stories. Mercurius's story unfolds fast, where ours usually take place over a lifetime. He is the sprinter, where most of us are jogging slowly and wheezing all the way. But that's why the detail of an angel healing Mercurius every night stands out to me. It's an obvious analog for the way we can stop to catch our breath in the peace and wonder of the Eucharist. If the core of the story is that Mercurius was the exemplary athlete of Christ, the man who held two swords and knew how to use each one, we can see why crusaders and Christian warriors have always looked to St. Mercurius for help. And if St. Mercurius had faced down an emperor before, perhaps we can see why St. Basil might turn to St. Mercurius for help against another emperor, the far more subtle Julian the Apostate. The Emperor Julian was well on his way to becoming a second Alexander the Great. He decided to split his army into two to confuse the enemy, then bring the two parts of the army together like pincers on the Persian capital city of Ctesiphon. It worked. Soon, Julian's half of the army was at the gates of the capital. The Persians were terrified. Now all that was needed was to await the arrival of the other part of the army and begin the siege. Julian waited. Victory was so close. But slowly the news came in that something had gone wrong. The other part of the army was stuck. Julian would have to go to them and bring them back to the city. Still, all was not lost, and Julian set out to reunite his army. On the way back... In a minor cavalry skirmish, someone threw a spear that arced through the air and lodged in the stomach of the man who wanted to be a second Alexander the Great. Julian was taken to his tent, dying. No one ever figured out where the spear came from. Christians said it had been a Persian who got in a lucky throw, while pagans accused Christians in the ranks of seizing the moment to kill the emperor. One interesting detail that appears in both pagan and Christian sources is this. As he lay on the ground, Julian took some of his blood and flung it into the air, as though in a final defiant gesture at someone there with him that only he could see. Disappointed pagans thought that perhaps Julian was cursing his gods for letting him fail. Christians suspected that in his last moments, Julian had seen a saint, or perhaps even Christ himself. Oddly enough, it became apparent soon after Julian's death that his attempt to hold back Christianity was as futile as had been Decius's attempt to hold back the Goths. Julian's version of paganism had a fundamental philosophical flaw. The paganism that Julian fondly remembered had grown up locally, organically, with people each worshipping their own gods and keeping an open mind toward the gods of other peoples and places. Christians worship a single, supreme god, the same in all times and places. Ironically, to bring paganism back, Julian's men had to mandate that there was a single correct way to be a pagan. Julian had, perhaps more than he realized, modeled himself on the universalist approach of Christianity. Julian's form of paganism didn't appeal to most Christians, and it didn't make sense to most pagans, and after his death, it was quickly abandoned. But on the day after the death of Julian, so the story goes, St. Basil returned to the icon. 
it would be days more before the news came in that the emperor had fallen in Persia. Now, Basil found that St. Mercurius was back in the icon. But there was something different. Leaning in close, Basil finally noticed what it was. It was the spear. Originally, St. Mercurius had been drawn holding a spear that was cleaned and ready for battle. Now the apostate emperor had fallen, killed by a mysterious spearman. And Mercurius' spear point was red with something that looked very much like blood. 